In this lesson, chapter 7.9, we're going to take a closer look at the skeletal structures of the upper limb. When we're done with this lesson, you'll be able to locate the bones that compose the upper limb and identify their major features. The bones of the upper limb form the framework of the arm, forearm, and hand. They also provide attachments for muscles and interact with muscles to move limb parts. These bones include a humerus, a radius, and ulna, carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. The humerus is a long bone that extends from the scapula to the elbow. At its upper end is a smooth, rounded head that fits into the glenoid cavity of the scapula. Just below the head are two processes, a greater tubercle on the lateral side and a lesser tubercle on the anterior side. These tubercles provide attachments for muscles that move the upper limb at the shoulder. Between them is a narrow furrow, the intertubercular tubercular sulcus, through which a tendon passes from a muscle in the arm. It's actually the biceps tendon, and it goes to the shoulder. The narrow depression along the lower margin of the head that separates it from the tubercles is called the anatomical neck. Just below the head and the tubercles of the humerus is a tapering region called the surgical neck, so named because fractures commonly occur there. Near the middle of the bony shaft on the lateral side is a rough V-shaped area called the deltoid tuberosity. It provides an attachment for the deltoid muscle that raises the upper limb horizontally to the side. At the lower end of the humerus are two smooth condyles, a uh, knob-like capitulum. On the lateral side and a pulley-shaped tro trochlea on the medial side. The capitulum articulates with the radius at the elbow, whereas the trochlea articulates with the ulna. Above the condyles on either side are the epicondyles, which provide attachments for muscles and ligaments of the elbow. Between the epicondyles anteriorly is a depression, the coracoid fossa, that receives a process of the ulna, the coronoid process, when the elbow bends. Another depression on the posterior surface, the elect Cranon, the olecranon fossa receives a different ulnar process, the olecranon process, when the elbow straightens. The radius, located on the thumb side of the forearm, is somewhat shorter than its companion. The ulna is its companion. The, the radius is the shorter of the two. The radius extends from the elbow to the wrist. It crosses over the ulna when the hand is turned so that the palm is faced backward. A thick disc-like head at the upper end of the radius articulates with the capitulum of the humerus and a notch of the ulna, the radial notch. This arrangement allows the radius to rotate. On the radial shaft just below the head is a process called the radial tuberosity. It is an attachment for a muscle, the biceps brachii, that bends the upper limb at the elbow. At the distal end of the radius, a lateral styloid process provides attachments for ligaments of the wrist. The ulna, located on the medial side of the forearm, is longer than the radius and overlaps the end of the humerus posteriorly. At its proximal end, the ulna has a wrench-like opening called the trochlear notch that articulates with the trochlea of the humerus. The process lies on either side of this notch. The olecranon process located above the trochlear notch provides an attachment for the muscles, uh, triceps brachii, that straightens the upper limb at the elbow. During this movement, the olecranon process of the ulna fits into the olecranon fossa of the humerus. Similarly, the coronoid process just below the trochlear notch fits into the coronoid fossa of the humerus when the elbow bends. At the distal end of the ulna, its knob-like head articul articulates laterally with a notch of the radius called the ulnar notch and with a disc of fibrocartilage inferiorly. This disc in turn joins a wrist bone, a triquium, a medial styloid process at the end of the ulna 
provides attachments for ligaments of the wrist. The hand is made up of the wrist, palm, and fingers. The skeleton of the wrist consists of eight small carpal bones in two rows of four bones each. The resulting compact mass is called the carpus. The carpus is rounded on its proximal surface where it articulates with the radius and with the fibrocartilaginous disc on the ulnar side. The carpus is concave anteriorly forming a canal through which tendons and nerves extend to the palm. Its distal surface articulates with the metacarpal bones. Five metacarpal bones, one in line with each finger, form the framework of the palm or metal metacarpus of the hand. These bones are cylindrical with round distal ends that form the knuckles of a clenched fist. The metacarpals articulate, articulate proximally with the carpals and distally with the phalanges. The metacarpals on the lateral side is the most freely movable. The metacarpal on the lateral side is the most freely movable. It permits the thumb to oppose the fingers when grasping something. These bones are numbered one to five, beginning with the metacarpal of the thumb. The phalanges are the finger bones. Three are in each finger. You have a proximal, a middle, and a distal phalanx. And two are in the thumb. The thumb lacks the middle phalanx. Thus, each hand has 14 finger bones.